Thank you and good evening. You heard I'm Doug B. Redder, the moderator for this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest and speaker. I just had a chance to hear him uh, with some high school students. They were quite fortunate and tremendous with students, as I'm sure he is in the classroom at Stanford. Uh, Senator Feingold uh, served 18 years in the uh, Senate from 1993 to 2011, of course representing Wisconsin. He's well known for leading the fight for campaign finance reform in the Senate alongside Senator John McCain. Feingold has always championed efforts to limit the influence of special interests. He was the only senator to vote against the Patriot Act, and he may want to speak about that. I'm sure you're interested, and was the first senator to propose a timetable to exit Iraq. Now, generally, members of the House or Senate refer to their, their colleagues as my friend. Actually, to show you the difference between the two houses, we never met until this, this <laughs> evening, although our, our time overlapped for 11 years. And we have some things in common. Uh, he served on the Foreign Relations Committee. I served on the Foreign Affairs Committee. He was on the Intelligence Committee. I was on the Intelligence Committee. There's some other similarities, too, just for curiosity. Um, well, let's see. He uh, defeated an incumbent state senator, his first elected of office. So did I. Uh, he, um, he conducted, uh, I heard, nearly 1,000 listening sessions or town hall meetings. I learned tonight it was 1,300. I thought I had the record. I do in the House, 980. I believe we both believe in participatory democracy. And fourth, uh, neither one of us were very popular in the Bush White House because of our views on the Iraq War. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give a welcome, a, well, a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker, Senator Russ Feingold. Well, first, thanks to the World Affairs Council. I, I actually spoke here once before in this room. I'm remembering it now. I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was a few years ago. It's good to be back at this uh, distinguished group, and thank you for your commitment to focusing on international issues, which I think is sorely needed and uh, obviously is part of the theme of what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, it is a pleasure to meet the, the congressman. Uh, I always had really good feelings about him, well aware of him. He is a classic example of, of what we all want in government now, a person from a different party who worked cooperatively in a moderate way with members of the other party, who was not afraid to focus on international issues who didn't just focus on, you know, one-liners or 30-second or spots, a uh, substantive, uh, honest, uh, good member of the House for many years. Uh, and I told him that I, through a series of factors, I ended up spending uh, part of the holidays in Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, and I had never been in Nebraska before. And, I mean, this is not a liberal state. This, this is the last state that Bill Clinton ever visited. He'd been to all 49, and yet uh, the congressman is a symbol of the kind of people that everybody tells me they want. They want people that will work together. So thank you for your kind words, and it's good to, it's good to finally meet you. <laughs> what I'll talk about tonight uh, for a little while, and then we'll uh, have some questions, is basically uh, the topic of the book that I wrote called While America Sleeps. And uh, the reason I wrote the book is the students asked me, they said, why'd you write this book? I said, well, after I lost the election, somebody, random house, said, how would you like to write a book? <laughs> and I said, that sounds good. And I said, what do you want me to write the book about? And I said, I don't know. Uh, they, I mean, they said, I don't know. We just need 100,000 words in eight months. So I said, well, I better come up with something. And, you know, I thought maybe writing a book about civil liberties, which concerns me a great deal, about Africa, which I've spent a lot of time on. People would have expected that the Feingold part of the McCain-Feingold might have written about campaign finance. McCain loved to joke that people in Wisconsin thought my first name was McCain because it was mentioned so many times. I might have written a book about my 1,300 listing sessions because I had some pretty good stories, and I'm sure you do. Uh, from yours, but I decided this probably might be the only chance I'll ever have to do something like this. I'd never written a book before. And I thought, you know, what is it that, that I need to, to say or I could say that's different that would give people a sense of something that I think is being missed after having spent 18 years in the United States Senate? I can't say it literally kept me up at night, 
but it really bothered me. Uh, and that is, it seemed that as a nation, even though we got this tremendous wake-up call, rest of the world, as if 9-11 had almost never occurred. And, you know, it's somewhat understandable that we lost our focus, in part because of the uh, disastrous economic collapse of 2008, the, the brutal political environment we found ourselves in uh, during the last few years. It is somewhat understandable. Everybody uh, turns inward when you have economic problems. That's not unusual. But I thought we all remembered, or would remember, what it felt like to be taken completely by surprise, as I would have to say any honest person would say they were, on September 11, 2001. That we had to figure out a way to look and con concentrate on international issues at the same time we focus on domestic issues, even if times are tough domestically. We can't just say, Oh, we'll get to the international stuff later after we fix up our domestic situation, or we're going to get not necessarily attacked again, but we will be compromised and weakened as a country if we do not have that kind of focus. Maybe there's a better cliche than this one, if you've got to give it to me, but I like, we need to walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> Instead, we have a government and a public that seems often divided against itself, refusing to come together to solve problems. We've got gridlock. We've got partisanship. We've got obsession with the next election. I mean, I was already asked on an interview of whether Joe Biden would run for president, and this was the day before the inauguration in Washington on CNN. I just said, can we give people a break, you know, over the, over the weekend, at least, <laughs> about worrying about the next election? We have the corrupting influence of unlimited undisclosed contributions, corrupting our political system. It reminds me of the words of Bob Dylan, who I love to quote in his song, Blind Willie McTell, where he says, power and greed and corruptible seed seem to be all that there is. And in the midst of all this, it seems to me that we have dangerously lost our focus on the events of 11 years ago and what they meant. Now, the reason I named the book While America Sleeps, for those of us who are in the over 50 category, perhaps, or really good students, as I'm sure you are, you might recognize what I was doing a takeoff on. It was a book that I thought was written by Winston Churchill, but I learned that he didn't write a book called While England Slept. His son compiled 40 speeches that Churchill gave as the opposition leader as Germany was rearming and Neville Chamberlain and others in Britain and France were sort of poo-pooing the danger of Hitler and the German rearmament. My book isn't about calling for rearmament, as you might expect, given my political background. But it is about a failure to sort of think in ways that suggest that we need to pay attention to events around the world. In one of Churchill's speeches, he talks about how the British people weren't used to thinking about foreign threats. He said in that speech in the Commons before he became Prime Minister, you know, we are a, a proud people, he said of the British. We've been unsubjugated. We haven't been conquered for a thousand years. We're not used to thinking about foreign threats. But he said, our situation has changed. And that reminds me so much of where we are at and where we were at as of 9-11, when a people who for over 200 years had basically been able to live separate. Yes, we had incidents, but our general mindset was these oceans protected us and we didn't have to worry about attacks on what's now called the homeland. That created a mindset that I think continues to today. Yes, we'll have flare-ups where we'll talk about Benghazi for a few days, or we'll talk about Algeria for a few days, but our, our default position, our nature, our training, our background 
is to not think in that global way and to train ourselves in that global way, myself included. Now, I actually remember, as I'm sure you all do, how it felt in the summer of 2001. Do you remember that summer? Very quiet summer. The leading story in, in the country was that there were a lot of shark attacks. It's called the summer of the shark. My theory is there's always a lot of shark attacks, but it was a slow news summer. But then the attack came, and there were warnings that none of us could really interpret as well as we should have. For example, the bombing of two of our embassies simultaneously in Dar es Salaam and Nairobi in 2008. The attack on the USS Cole in 2000 in Yemen. And I think we all remember the chilling nature of the threat to destroy those Buddhas in Bamiyan, Afghanistan. I remember thinking, there's no way they're going to blow those Buddhist natural, national or international uh, sites up. Who would do such a thing? Hitler didn't even blow up the Oxford colleges in St. Paul's because he wanted to use them for himself. But they did it. And I remember thinking, this is different. But we didn't have the background and the knowledge to interpret it. But actually, the incident that most chilling for me had to do with the fact that as a member of Congress or a senator, you do get the opportunity to go on some of these uh, trips to other countries uh, with your colleagues. And I went to Nigeria because I specialized in Africa issues in the Senate. And we were, in, we were there to talk about corruption and some of the issues in, in Nigeria. It was sort of bad timing to talk about how they needed to clean up their election process. I was sort of lecturing them about it in early 2001, and they started laughing at me. I went, oh, yeah, we just had a little problem with our election here. You know, to, to them hanging chads, you know, there's a country next to them called Chad. So it was kind of, kind of funny. So the purpose of the trip had nothing to do with terrorism or the issues that came in 9-11. But this is early 2001, and we flew up to a city known as Kano, K-A-N-O. Kano is a city of several million people. It is one of the largest Islamic countries in the world, maybe the fifth or sixth largest in the world. We had no diplomatic presence there. We flew up there in a little plane, and the second in command at our embassy actually spent all his time trying to figure out how to order some steaks that he liked from a, a butcher there. We had no real presence, and this city has been on the ancient route of Islamic culture and trade for th over a thousand years all the way from Afghanistan, yes, to Timbuktu. And that's a long way. As we walked the street in Kano, my staff member and I noticed that the kids had T-shirts and postcards, not only of Gaddafi, but also of bin Laden. I kind of knew who he was, Osama bin Laden, obviously. But I said to my staff member, I said to Michelle, could you, when we get back, you know, what's going on? with This is a long way from Afghanistan. Could you get me a briefing on this? And she worked hard to get that briefing from the intelligence people. And they, they got it scheduled for me, all right? September 13th, 2001. Uh, needless to say, we were embroiled with other things at that point. But that's an illustration of where we were at at the time, all of us. You know, we got, got off to a pretty good start after 9-11. I really feel that way. I felt that President Bush's speech to the Congress a few weeks after 9-11 was the best speech I ever heard a president give in that chamber, and I got to attend a lot of them. Bill Clinton's were good, but they were really long, <laughs> really long. Bush was more concise. And then Colin Powell did a wonderful job of carefully, methodically lining up the support of countries all over the world, including almost every Islamic country, including Islamic countries that had not been on the same side of us in the first Gulf War. And it seemed like we did this and the American people were perfectly accepting of the delay of waiting, not expecting us to immediately attack the next day, but to get our ducks in a row, if you will. Then things went haywire. For whatever reason, and that it will be debated for probably a thousand years, the Bush administration decided the next good move would be to go into Iraq. And this Republican congressman, as he pointed out, was not a favorite 
of the Bush administration because he questioned after the war began whether it was such a good idea. I was wondering about it. When I write in my book, the chapter is called The Iraq Deception. I was ready to vote for the Iraq War if they could show a connection to bin Laden or if we really believe there were weapons of mass destruction that Saddam Hussein would use. But the president ran around telling everybody there were 60 countries where al-Qaeda was operating. So I got the list that he had. And, you know, like there were a lot of countries on the list. Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, and Kazakhstan, and <laughs> India, and Ireland, and Great Britain. Guess what country wasn't even on the list? Iraq. What a crazy thing to do. And then what happened was, you know the story of what happened, but the point I want to make, and the reason I wrote a chapter about this called A Game of Risk, is we started to think about everything in terms of the prism from the Bush administration and for some members of Congress who had voted for it, which was to somehow rationalize going into Iraq as being a logical response to al-Qaeda. And I compared to the game of risk, and I'm always relieved when I mention something and young people know what I'm talking about. If I mention the shell answer man, Jesus getting worse every time I say it. This is an ad back in the 60s. But young people know what the game of risk is, thank God. And in the game of risk, once you invade a country, you have to keep some of your troops there for the whole game. You can't sort of finish it and leave. It seems that our attitude after Iraq was this country by country view. Now it's Iraq. It was Afghanistan before. Joe Lieberman once said after the Christmas bomber tried to attack uh, in Detroit, on the plane in Detroit. So now it's Yemen. It's, it's like we can't think in two directions about this. It's like we can't think in terms of cross-border threats or issues. It's like a Cold War or World War II mentality that makes it very hard for us to think in a different paradigm. And in a way... There's another game that's a better game to think about, and that's the game of Scrabble. My mother uh, was very good at Scrabble and used to clobber me at it, but the best player I ever played was a guy that uh, subletted my apartment in Wisconsin in the early uh, 70s when Watergate was going on. He was a biochemist from Taiwan. It was like in his 30s or 40s. He couldn't understand any of what we were interested in. We were enjoying watching Nixon sweat on TV and you know, doing our own thing as younger people. And so we didn't have a lot in common. He didn't know English very well, but he said, his name was Rudong Wee. He said, Russ, how would you like to play Scrabble? And I went, oh, great. You know, the guy clobbered me every time. He got a seven-word score every time, it seemed like. And I finally said to Rue, I said, how do you do that? He said, Russ, you must always think in two directions. And that is what we must learn to do when it comes to many things, including the threat of an organization like Al-Qaeda. Now, I've been giving this talk ever since I wrote this book and finished it in September of 2011. And so many audiences have heard me talk about Algeria and Mali, and they had to sort of look to see where it was, at least with regard to Mali in many cases. But what I was trying to illustrate was the interconnections. And those interconnections are still being missed. What I focus on is the country of Algeria. Because Algeria, as many of you know, was a place where they had to fight in a brutal fight for independence from France. It's a, uh, portrayed in, 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 uh, in, in the movie uh, The Battle of Algiers, which is a great movie from the 1960s. And they got their independence. And then in the early 90s, there were some elections where an Islamic, not at all extreme party, but an Islamic party won the preliminary elections. And the old guard from the revolution, who were still in charge there, canceled the final elections. In comes a group of people who later called themselves uh, uh, the GSPC, a Salafist group, a more extremist Islamic group. And they turned, tried to turn people against the government using violence, using terrorism. Uh, they would go to a village, and they would say, would you please protect us here in, in southern Algeria? And if they didn't, they killed every single person in the town. And go to the next town, and pretty soon people started cooperating. 
and the government brutally repressed them in response. Nobody knew anything about it in the states, or maybe the congressman did, but you know, basically it was not on our radar screen. And so finally in the 90s, this GSPC group was diminished to a point where they kind of fled into the southern Algeria, to Mali, to Chad, to the Central African Republic. They were really almost gone, we thought. And then came 9-11. And after a few years, they thought, we're going we're gonna to sign up with al-Qaeda. So they renamed themselves al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, AQIM. Maybe you've heard that name now. When I talked about this a year ago, nobody had heard of it. And it's not just AQIM. In the book, I talked about the growing threat in North Africa. Neither the administration nor any of the Republican candidates were talking about this at all. And yet, we had al-Shabaab in Somalia, which is an al-Qaeda chapter. We have a growing threat of a group called Boko Haram in Nigeria, based in, guess where, Kano, the city that I just mentioned. And so when Mali was overtaken in the north, it was, in part, AQIM. It's Algerians. The recent attack in Algeria was by one of the people who had been involved in the original group that radicalized Algeria. Now, I heard Fareed Zakaria do an excellent little piece the other day about this threat, but he missed something very important. He said, let's be careful to not just assume just because these people are Muslims and because they are doing bad things that they are necessarily tied to al-Qaeda. That's a good caution. But here's what he missed. The people who are doing this who are Algerians are not just people that have hung out in Algeria. In the late 80s and early 90s, they were in Afghanistan. They got their training with bin Laden. 3,000 Algerians went there and came back and have been doing this ever since. They have sustained attention. They have the ability to continue to think about and operate on this for a very long period of time. And so as brilliant a journalist as Zakaria, his researchers didn't find that critical fact. And the guy that masterminded this attack at, in Algeria at the gas plant is a guy called Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar. He was one of these people who was in from the beginning and has been at this for decades just like bin Laden was. So my point here is if you only think of in terms of Mali's the problem now or Yemen's the problem now, you don't see the interconnections. And you know, Mali is a heck of a long way from Somalia, Huge, thousands of miles. And yet, how far do you think it is from Somalia to the Arabian Peninsula? I once asked my staff, I said, man, it looks kind of close. Said, what is it, 1,000 miles? It's 20 miles. Nice swim if it wasn't for the sharks. 20 miles. And so we don't realize Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is just a few miles away. So my goal here is not to, A, just make people afraid of a terrorist threat. I don't want to exaggerate the capacity of Al-Qaeda. This may have to do with our economic competition. This may have to do with what China's doing. This may have to do with what Iran's doing. The point is, if we don't know where these places are, if we don't think about them and educate ourselves about them, and at least have a sense about them in advance, we are always playing catch up. We are always having our reporters going, ooh, you know, what, what's, what's the story in Algeria? Why don't we know about these places? It is a complicated world. It is intimidating to try to learn all this. I, the analogy I make is to the baseball teams when I was a kid. You know, there were seven teams in the American League when I grew up. It was easy to keep track of it. Now it's hard to keep track of it, just like the countries. Basically, when I grew up, it was a bipolar world, the Soviet Union versus the United States, and that's what you had to know. It is much harder now. But if we want to be safe and if we want to be successful and if we want to be good citizens of the rest of the world, we need to do better. Let me conclude this part of my <coughs> remarks. So I don't filibuster this. We could be teaching about filibusters out at the uh, Stanford. By uh, telling you just about another publication that has a similar name. In 1940, 
uh, a senior at Harvard wanted to write a little commentary on Churchill's book, While England Slept. And he was a well-connected Harvard senior because he got his dad to publish his senior honors thesis. And this is what this guy said. His name was John F. Kennedy. He said, to say that democracy has been awakened by the events of the last few weeks is not enough. Any person will awaken when the house is burning not down. What we need is an armed guard that will wake up when the fire first starts, or better yet, one that will not permit a fire to start at all. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Feingold. Very stimulating remarks, and uh, your book is tremendous in stimulating a lot of people to raise some questions that you address in your book. We have great questions, great diversity. I'm having a hard time grouping them, but we, we'll start with a couple where we do have some, uh, some common theme. Uh, this question relates to what's deemed to be uh, uh, extrajudicial killing. It goes to drones and the particular new uh, questions that kind of technology raises. What do you think about the recent uh, 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 white paper that came out yesterday? Yeah. Is it illegal to kill American citizens without due process by trial? That's sort of a group of three. Yeah. Okay. L let me first apologize to people over here. I guess it's better for the radio that if I sit here. So, hello. And I'm over here. Anyway, this is terribly complicated. Let me state proposition one. I do not think the use of drones is always wrong. I think there are occasions where it's an appropriate uh, tactic to use in a properly uh, commenced war against an enemy. For example, if we had been able to drop a drone on bin Laden, I would have been totally comfortable with that. Having said that, any use of drones in any situation where we think we might have a problem now or in the future, to me, is questionable. And I think there might be a tendency now to say, this is an easier way to do war. The question raised is, what about if it's an American citizen? Well, that raises a number of other very serious questions, because Americans are entitled to due process of law. And I do think I, I was pleased when Al Aki was, was taken out, because of what he had done to us in Fort Hood and Arkansas and other places. But I'm not satisfied with the legal underpinning as it has been presented. The White House has said that it fit the law. But in order for it to fit the law, the killing has to be of somebody who clearly was part of the enemy, and I don't think there's any serious question there. But it's more than that. That had to be the only way he could have been gotten. Now, we've never seen the proof of that. Nor is it clear to me that in a situation like that, you couldn't go to an in-camera or secret session with a judge. Now, there may be emergency situations, but I'm not sure this was that way at all. Why does due pro How can due process involve President Obama and Mr. Brennan sitting around in a room going, let's kill this guy? That's what they've alleged. This is what this administration has said, is that there's something called executive due process. Now, I never heard about that in law school. And they're smart kids out at Stanford. I asked them if they had ever heard of it. They had never heard of it either. So now, this white paper that's come out suggests something even more troubling. It suggests that the administration is talking about situations that don't even involve an imminent attack, but somebody who who's an American citizen who we think might at some point do something like this. I think we're on incredibly shaky ground here. And I think we're entitled to see the legal, this isn't the legal opinion, it's just a white paper. We, the members of Congress, let alone we, those of us in the broader public, have not been allowed to see uh, the legal opinion justifying this. You know, you got a law professor over here at Berkeley named John Yu. He wrote some awful memos for the Office of Legal Counsel that we didn't get to see until they were leaked out, justifying torture and warrantless wiretapping. You know, they can redact this document. That means they can take out anything that has to do with names or 
you know, anything that's going to tip off the enemy. I don't think there's any justification whatsoever for us not to see that information. And this is an area that definitely needs legal standards, and I, I think it's reaching sort of a crisis point at this point. Thank you, Senator. Here's a, a group of two or three, and uh, it's very much in the news. Simple question. What's your view on immigration reform? I think it's absolutely essential. I'm excited about it because I think it's going to get done. You know, the history of this issue is kind of strange. Back in the, uh, like, 2005, 2006, there was a good head of steam in favor of comprehensive immigration reform, supported by George Bush and John McCain, the last two candidates for president before Romney on the Republican side. There was no reason it shouldn't happen until sort of the precursors of the Tea Party and some Democrats got together and started claiming that this was going to, you know, take away American jobs and was going to create all kinds of illegal people being here forever, even though it did provide for people having to go back to their home country and pay a penalty and do a lot of different things that certainly did not look like amnesty. This had a head of steam, and, but it was stopped in the name of divisive politics. You know, one thing, uh, Congressman, that I've, I've tried to point out to people that they forget is some of the, Repu the Republican strategy in 2008 was going to be to hang the immigration issue around the Democrats' neck to say they're for bringing in all these people. They couldn't, though, because McCain was their nominee. So it didn't work. And then Romney found out maybe not such a good idea to lose 70% of the Latino vote uh, to show no sympathy for something that is supported not only by Democrats and Latinos, but by the business community. The leaders, the captains of industry in this country want this fixed. And so I think it's fixable. It's not easy. And the notion that individual states like Arizona are going to do this is insane. It has to be a national policy. So I'm pleased that the president and this bipartisan I think it's called the Gang of Six, right, has gotten together, and I think this will happen. Uh, and I think it'll be the first big victory of overcoming partisanship that I hope will lead to other things. Senator, this question will take you back to an area of your particular interest, I think. What do you think of the U.S. current aspiration regarding security in Africa, for example, AFRICOM, a possible intervention in Somalia and the potential for future blowback? What is our future there, meaning Africa, likely to be like? Okay, this, this connects with another aspect of what I try to write about in my book. It's when we hear about a problem like Mali or Algeria or anything that's going on, our first reaction is, what should we do? On whose head should we drop a bomb? Should we send troops in? It's the first thing that reporters ask. That shouldn't be the first thing that we think about. We should think about broader strategy. And just repeat the, the front of that again. Well, what do you think about uh, AFRICOM? Is this going to take us deeper into Africa and a possible blowback? You know, what is Africa? And specifically, Somalia is mentioned. What is Africa? I didn't know until I went to the Senate that, you know, our military was divided around the world into different regions. UCOM is Europe. PACOM is, is Pacific. And there is an AFRICOM. It's a new thing. But because of anxiety in Africa about having a military presence there from the United States, it's based in Stuttgart, where, where the UCOM is. So I, I've met with the AFRICOM people. The concept makes sense in this way. Africa should have its own region, but in terms, and have its own command. The problem is if you start putting bases and things in Africa, it creates great suspicions among the populace that it's an attempt to recolonize. You know, one of our advantages in Africa is that we were not a colonial power there. It's one of the things we got going for us. So there's enormous anxiety in places like Nigeria about having an organization like this. It is completely understaffed. It has no f force uh, essentially of its own. It's all based on whatever the Europeans can give them, the UCOM can give them. So my problem with it is we shouldn't lead with this. I think it's a good thing to have. We should lead with a diplomatic and other approaches, and unfortunately, the conversation seems to be, you know, who do we need to kill in order to solve this problem? 
We cannot look at the problem of al-Qaeda as a manhunt. It's not that simple. It's not just kill this guy and this guy, and they'll come back, and they won't, they'll be done. If you watch the movie The Battle of Algiers, which I urge every one of the students to watch, maybe you all have, it's fantastic. And you see in there that the French won the Battle of Algiers. They figured out how the Algerian resistance worked, and they had a little chart, and they, we get this guy, we get this guy, and we get this guy, and they killed him. But they lost the war because the way that the people reacted after this brutal French attack in the Battle of Algiers was to demand overwhelmingly their independence. We need to learn the lesson that it is not simply, you know, killing the top command of al-Qaeda and thinking that that solves the problem. So AFRICOM can help with this, but it should not be the main strategy. All right, Senator, there's a very interesting uh, question, at least way of putting it. Uh, is our pursuit of Islamic terrorists rather like the game of a mole <laughs> How is it possible to address Islamic f fanaticism in Yemen, West Africa, and the rest of the world? How is it possible to do it realistically? Well, that's very similar to the last uh, thing I was just saying. And, you know, I started this whole game thing with risk and scrabble, so I can't get too irritated about whack-a-mole, but, uh, gee, I hear it a lot. And it's, it's, it's the only way people apparently can conceptualize this thing. And, again, it's thinking of it as a manhunt. It's like bad guy here, bad guy there, without distinguishing between who these different people are. You know, sometimes in these situations, there may be a, a, a radical or even a, just an Islamic group that has absolutely nothing to do with al-Qaeda. Zakaria is right about that. In Mali, the group Ansardin is a Tuareg group that are the people that first took over northern Mali, okay, when this thing happened. They had no international agenda at all. They had nothing to do with al-Qaeda. AQIM came in and took over. They're the ones that came in and started amputating people's legs and tearing, burning up mosques and so on. So to think of it only as let's just whack this guy here instead of understanding those intricacies, that the people of those areas usually don't like this sort of thing. In fact, they're thrilled now. This, this group was not terribly happy with what AQIM did. But it's just like in, in Afghanistan. Certainly the Taliban is a very disturbing group. But they did not have any international agenda until they made buddies with al-Qaeda. They've been there forever. They will be there forever. So to think of it as just whack-a-mole ignores the complexity of these groups within a country that uh, terrorist groups try to exploit. Senator, here's a question that you address in your, your book at, at some length. and. Uh, with a great specificity, what do you believe, excuse me, do you believe in American exceptionalism? If so, what does it mean to you? Oh, I do believe in American exceptionalism in the sense that I think this is a great country. Uh, I still, of course, am as just like I'm a White Sox fan and a Wisconsin Badger fan, I think it's the greatest country in the world. The trouble is that the way in which this phrase is used is damaging. It's being used as a mantra, uh, particularly on the right, to make people take a fortress attitude about the United States. Instead of trying to figure out ways in which we can connect with the rest of the world in a more positive way, as President Obama has tried to do very successfully, the test uh, in these debates was, do you believe in American exceptionalism? It's pretty funny to see a guy like Tim Pawlenty of Minnesota saying, oh, yes, I'm for American exceptionalism. It's just a phrase. But it's a phrase that isn't received terribly well overseas. I've been with people in Italy and in England and other places, and you hear that, and they go, well, you know, we've been around a while in Italy and England, and we've done some good things <laughs> over the years. It's insulting to just – what I compared it to in the book is if somebody's asleep and they wake up and they just yell out, we're number one, and you go back to sleep. It's, it's not – very helpful. It's like my mom said, if you go to the playground and you brag, the kids aren't going to like you. That's the problem with sort of using this in a mindless way. 
And I know I'll be criticized for saying, criticizing American exceptionalism. But I'm not going to take second place to anybody in my patriotism. But I refuse to have a phrase used that only hurts us in the way it's being used. So I, I think it, we need to, I think we can do a little better with that. Here's a question that's uh, asked with some uh, emphasis. What can we really, underline really, do about Iran's nuclear weapons threats? It appears that sanctions don't work is this person's conclusion. I take a different conclusion. I think sanctions have had a significant impact. The, the uh, sanctions, according to the evidence I've seen, although I haven't checked on it lately, but in a few weeks ago, their currency had dropped very dramatically to the point, because of the sanctions, to the point where the pressure in Iran uh, to change course was enormous. Again, because of our lack of background on overseas issues, we don't really know enough about the complexity of Iran. Iran is not Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Iran is a complicated political system, even more ancient than, uh, than England and Italy, the, the countries that were offended, the people that were offended. They've been around a while. And they have a very intellectual and educated public. Aminijad is not all powerful. Khamenei is not all powerful. It is a country where pressure points can work. The reason we have a rotten relationship with the country has to do with the CIA's involvement in the early 1950s in deposing President Mossadegh, who was duly elected as their prime minister. It goes back to that time. But it is not inherently an enemy country. Sanctions are appropriate. I agree with the president. No option should be taken off the table. If we absolutely had to attack to prevent them from getting a nuclear weapon, so be it. I don't think that is what's going on here. And I do give an example in the book of the kinds of things we can do. On one of these trips, the congressman and I were talking about how we both think Indonesia is one of the most interesting countries in the world. It's not just interesting. It is the fourth largest country in the world population-wise, the largest Islamic country in the world. And I had a chance to go there and meet with the president, Yudo Yono. So, you know, as a senator, I got like a half hour with him. I had to pick what I was going to talk to him about. And I wanted to talk to him about what, he, what had been done in East Timor. I wanted to talk to him about the killing of people in some parts of the country. I wanted to talk to him about the issues in Aceh and, and other issues. But I, I used part of my time to say to Mr. President, why was Indonesia one of five countries to not vote to um, send uh, Iran uh, for, to the Security Council for violations? And he was very nice. He said, you know, we're looking at this, we're thinking about it, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we may change course later. He heard that message from an American senator. They have a good relationship with Iran. We have a good relationship with them. This is the kind of global politics and using your global chits at the right time, at the right place, obviously at a much higher level than I was, that can cause Iran to make a judgment that it really isn't in their interests or anyone's interests, including even the leadership, to continue on the route of getting a nuclear weapon. This question will take you back to Southeast Asia. What are the solutions to increased competition for resources that avoid military conflict, such as the developing tensions over territorial claims in the South China Sea and its oil and mineral resources. You should answer this. You, you know about this. He knows more about this than I do by far. And, and I really do not know the answer. But I will say this. We, as a people, have got to sort of figure out something that's very complicated, which is what, what is China doing? What are their goals? How can we establish a positive relationship with China but be realistic? You know, are there military goals? Are there just economic goals? I don't know about that situation, but I do know about China and Africa. When you go to Africa in almost any country, when you fly into the country, you see a lot of poverty, but you see this gorgeous soccer stadium in the, in the capital, always. It's built by the Chinese. And why do the Chinese go there? Not just because they're being nice. It's because they want the resources. They're interested in the resources of those countries. And, you know, they don't make demands on human rights. They say, don't worry about it. Just let us get the resources and we'll build this for you. Our challenge is to create uh, connections in places like this that are more 
honest, that are not about exploitation, and peacefully compete with the Chinese by saying, you know, we want to help you create a non-corrupt, legitimate, democratic system while we invest in your country. So it's a form of competition that I think I still believe in the American approach does better in the long run, but at the moment they have the lead on us because we're not sufficiently engaged. Senator, both of us have had to act on State Department authorization bills over some years, and this question goes directly to the subject of the size of our foreign service. Uh, this person makes the point there are uh, allegedly, and I think it's accurate, more members of military bands than foreign service officers. Yeah. What are the chances of adding more foreign service officers? Well, we're crazy if we don't. You know, I told you about Kano, uh, places like Madan in Indonesia. We need more presence, positive presence. Uh, when I was in Algeria in the mid 2000s, before all this happened, I learned a lot about what I was talking about tonight. The ambassador lived in this magnificent French, basically, mansion, but it was a complete fortress. It was so it's very unsafe to go out. So it's this gorgeous view of Algiers, but very dangerous place. And he said he was trying to you know, reach out to the Islamic population there in a positive way, but he had absolutely no budget to do any programming of that kind. It also involves intelligence officers. I never thought I'd come to this perspective, but I did serve on the Intelligence Committee for five years, and I think we do need a greater intelligence presence in some places and less in others. We, had, we took all our intelligence people and moved them into Iraq. What a great move, you know? It's it was nuts. And so we're, we need diplomatic and intelligence and not just military presence in these places. So I would definitely support. And the other thing is this, is to recognize the danger of these jobs now. I've been to some places like Angola where it was obviously dangerous from day one. But essentially now, being in the Foreign Service in many, many countries. Uh, I was thinking the other day, you know what, like, Turkey's such a wonderful place. I've never been to Turkey, but it's a place I'd love to go. Well, sure enough, a couple of people were killed at the embassy the other day. Uh, it's very dangerous work. We need to honor it like we honor military service, because it is, it is honorific work. Set a domestic question here. What are your views on the growing income gap between the wealthy and the, uh, the working class in America? Well, it's been a sad progression over the years that, that you and I were in government. Uh, the strength of the middle class and a healthy middle class where people can work hard and count on having a decent retirement and health care is essential not only to, for justice and, and our society, but also for the stability of our society. The grotesque nature of great wealth, even though it's always fun to read about, you know, you kind of go, wow, you know, this guy's got a house this big or this kind of wine cellar or whatever. Uh, it's just gone too far. And I'm not interested in extreme taxation, but I am interested in not having uh, the so-called 1% being immunized from having to participate in solving our fiscal problems. I didn't know that I was preparing for this when I read a book uh, last couple days about uh, <clears throat> the folks from this town who basically built the, the Transcontinental Railroad, Mr. Stanford and Mr. Huntington and others. But, you know, that was the Gilded Age. And the disparity in wealth and the problems of corruption in government that came from those disparities and the abuse of it did lead to a, a progressive era that turned that around. We need another era like that uh, because the power of big money, which both parties are participating in full-fledged, has corrupted our system of government in the last just two or three years since the Citizens United decision. It was a problem before, but now it is a terrible cancer on our system. I guarantee you, McCain always says, there will be a scandal. The scandal's already happened. We just don't have the capacity yet to figure out What's going on in these conversations when people are asked for unlimited, undisclosed contributions? I guarantee you it's corrupt, and it will be a huge scandal, and it's happening tonight. The phone calls are being made tonight. 
Senator Plango, do you have any suggestions for uh, the better use of American soft power? I've never loved the term soft power. It just sounds weird to me that you sort of, I know what it is. It's, it's an idea that you use things other than military. So in a way, I've been talking about it. I think Hillary Clinton uses the term smart power, mm -hmm. but the, the general term is soft power. I like the term smart power because it suggests that people are knowledgeable about other places. And, and one of the things I'd love to have talked about tonight, but there wasn't time, is sort of the, some of the solutions that I proposed in the last part of my book. Number one is like knowing where places are and, wh and what countries are. And so I, I quote a young man from University, uh, Marquette University who wrote a column in the student newspaper there that I happened to read when I was teaching at Marquette Law School that was entitled, Where in the World is Tunisia? And he said, you know, I'm a pretty good student. Why well, don't I even know? I've never even heard of this place. Uh, so it begins with that and education for all of us. The, the second thing is smart power, soft power involves knowing foreign languages. And here I am completely guilty, mea culpa. My mother, who I mention frequently, knew five or six languages fluently. She was an abstractor, but she was a very good linguist in college. And I just decided I didn't need any of that. I thought it was a waste of time. Didn't take Latin, didn't, I took French in high school. What a mistake. And as a country, we have failed to really focus on learning foreign languages, uh, partly because of, an, of a national strategy. The founders of our country wanted us to come together. So they wanted people to drop the old languages and to come together with one language. Makes sense. But in World War II, our military panicked when they realized we, it wasn't that we couldn't understand our enemies, we couldn't understand our allies. And they created the Defense uh, Language School here, which I think is in this area, Monterey. But we're still way behind. I think there's been some improvement since 9-11, but we are way, way behind as a people, and I know these young people are going to help us turn that around. Finally, Congressman, I know that you've done so much in this area, but basically calling on all Americans to figure out a way individually to connect with the rest of the world, basically private diplomacy. And that's a form of smart power. Uh, my favorite story is a guy named Damon Shemansky from Green Bay, not far from Lambeau Field. My condolences to the 49ers uh, who beat the Packers. Uh, Damon came to me in the early 90s and said, and he was an older dairy farmer. He said to me, Russ, uh, I just want you to know I went with this uh, VOCA program, Volunteers of America program, which you obviously know about. He said, I, they sent me out to the former Soviet Republic and, and to help on a dairy farm to, to see what I could do to make it do, go better. And he said, you know, Russ, there was so much bacteria in the milk, it could walk to market by itself. <laughs> Some people think that's funny. Um, and then, then I thought, didn't think much about it. Ten years later, the guy comes back. He'd been to 30 other countries doing this. And we need to figure out ways to facilitate Americans going to these places, having that kind of positive contact with people, and coming back, not only having made a positive impression, but telling us what's going on. We have no scouting report on the rest of the world to speak of. And so those are some examples, I could go on forever, but of the sort of smart power that I think we should explore. The program you talk about is called Farmer to Farmer Program, and it sent about eight or 9,000 Americans, all volunteers, to go over and work for six to eight weeks. And they come back better Americans, and they leave a lot of benefits behind them. Here's a question that uh, really relates to it, and it's uh, an idea that Senator Wolford and others have had about some kind of national service uh, for everyone, including uh, a foreign kind of Peace Corps involvement or a domestic corps, a AmeriCorps. Do you have any thoughts about that? It's been uh, offered in various ways as a Senate initiative in the past. That's right. I, I think maybe Birch Bayh was talking about it when he was in the Senate. His son Evan Bayh from Indiana talked about when he was in the Senate. You know, I think the, the main question is should it be mandatory or, or voluntary? Uh, I would hope to the extent it occurs there would be an international component uh, to address the things I was just talking about. One of my students at Stanford is, is writing a proposal um, to do exactly this. And I think it would be something that would, uh, at, at least in a voluntary form, 
would be well received, although uh, there would be a lot of details to work out. But I do think, I think it would be a good way to bring Americans together, uh, having that common experience. There are so many great questions here, and we're, in all purposes, out of time. Um, there's one time for one more, and I'm going to ask you uh, what this question is. Uh, what do you think of uh, President Obama's nominations for defense uh, and state? Of course, state is now filled. Uh, will it shape the Obama doctrine, or will it simply help him execute his current foreign policy uh, in a more forthright or efficient fashion? I think President Obama and his people in the White House run a tight ship. It will be the Obama policies. And uh, I think Senator Kerry, former Senator Kerry now, can't believe I'm saying that after all those years, uh, understands it. I'm sure uh, Mr. Hagel understands it as well. Uh, I think the president is as well informed and intuitive about international issues as almost any president we've ever had. Uh, and I think that he is going to be a very important president in our history with regard to foreign policy. I think he really cares a great deal about solving problems like uh, the Middle East problems and resolving the Iranian situation and, and making sure we stay ahead of a number of other issues. So I think, uh, I think Hagel and Kerry will be loyal to him and are both capable and uh, will do a fine job. I also think that you had a wonderful guy from Monterey here running the Defense Department, Leon Panetta, who, you know, I saw Panetta as a congressman I saw him as a chief of staff, OMB, CIA, and defense. What a wonderful career. Uh, what, a, what a great American, really. And I disagree with him. I give him a little bit of hard time in here. But I'll tell you, a guy that came in to run the CIA the way he did, and I saw, it's behind closed doors. He was terrific. Uh, and the fact that he was able to get that kind of respect, you know, from people who are very insular in the CIA, is a real tribute to to uh, Leon, who, I don't know if you saw, he said he's going back to his walnut farm. He's left one group of nuts for another. <laughs> that was too easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to remind you about the tremendous book that uh, Senator Feingold has just written, and I think you'll find it very interesting. I certainly did. He'll be available for the next 15 minutes or so to sign books for anybody who would like to have them. And if you pass through that line, uh, I know you're tempted to have a long conversation, but uh, keep it short and wonderfully warm And because we want to keep that line moving so everybody can have a chance. But I want to uh, conclude by th saying to Senator Russ Feingold what a tremendous uh, experience his presentation and his question responses to our question has been. Thank you very much, Senator. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you so much.